Hello and welcome to the podcast, 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn, where we dispense wisdom, not just information or mere fact, to an international audience of rising leaders. My name is Duff Watkins and I'm your host. This podcast is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum, which helps young professionals of any age accelerate their performance and their career in the modern workplace. And today you'll hear honest, practical advice that you can't find in any textbook because it took 50 years to learn this stuff. Our guest today is Eddie Grobler. Eddie is the, well, he had a 20 plus year career in MasterCard, international MasterCard. You know, the one in your wallet, you know, this one with the logo. <laughs> do you have a, do you have one as lime green as mine? No, you don't have one like That's that. That's a nice color. I know, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> special card for special people, Eddie. Of course, of course. They just mailed it to me. I don't know where it came from. I met Eddie when he was heading Australasia for MasterCard and since he was promoted to become executive vice president in the UK with a special project, which basically was the integration of a new company. And But he's now back in Australia in non-retirement. Welcome, welcome, Eddie. Thank you, Duff. Um, you know, and interesting uh, in terms of retirement, you know, somebody said to me some time ago, there's no such a thing as retirement. It's rewirement. So after 20 years, I'm, I'm going actually to rewiring the MasterCard and, 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 and actually putting the wires in somewhere else as well. And then, but life is fun. It, it's really good. Yeah, I, I know you're doing a variety of, of things. Um, uh, uh, philanthropic, I suppose, is one of them. Now, to start, let me ask you the first question. You come from South Africa, which uh, was, is a developing country. Do you recall your first business lesson? Yes, you know, this, this was in, I think, in, in 1985, uh, when I uh, started to work with one of the banks in South Africa. And um, the, there was a person that I, I really always respected. He was not my direct boss, he was a boss, you know, he, mm -hmm. my boss reported into him. Mm -hmm. um, and he, um, he was a person that I always respected, and I, I felt that he had a lot of wisdom. Uh, but he actually uh, reconfirmed the concept of ownership with me, you know, and taking ownership for everything that you do in life. Mm -hmm. And he, the, I, I think what made it so valuable to me is that he actually shared it in, in a story, a, a true African story with me. And then I can share the story with you if you want me to. Uh, but that really resonated with me and it stayed for me for my life. And I've actually tried to share that with my family and even people that I'm mentoring as well is, is the whole concept of, of ownership and taking ownership for what you do and what you stand for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay, how about what have you unlearned lately? And by that, I mean something you absolutely positively knew to be true then, but now you realize that's not the case. Yeah, this is possibly a bit more in a philosophical way. You must keep in mind that I've been in corporate life for about 40 years. And, um, you know, when I retired, you know, it's obviously something that actually I realized. And this is the concept of that systems actually are bigger than individuals and, and systems have their own kind of uh, pace and their own kind of momentum. And then I'll compare it with, with a kind of a, 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 I think, example. Somebody said to me, it's like putting your hand in, in a bucket of water and the bucket of water is corporate life. And then you take the, your hand out and it just flows. It just closes, you know. So sometimes you, you get into a phase in your life where you feel that um, you are the tail that's wagging the dog, the dog being the system or the company that you work for and that you make a huge impact. But the systems goes on. That doesn't imply that you can't make an impact on organizations and mm -hmm. you can't actually contribute. That's definitely not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that, you know, I think all of us go through kind of phases in our lives where we feel that we, um, you, you know, if, if we're not part of the organization, they will definitely suffer and won't be able to move on. That, that's not true. Yeah. Organizations got their own rhythm. But uh, I think the counter side of that coin is that you also always contribute and uh, bring value to the organization. But uh, that's something that I've realized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what did you unlearn? Did you were, did, before? Did you think that your um, um, well, yeah. What did you think before you realized that? Which, by the way, is a hard lesson that everybody needs to learn. Yeah, I think it's and and I don't like the word, but it's it's the concept of of 
um, leaving your kind of footprints in organization or mm -hmm. some people say legacy, but it's legacy. a strong term to you. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's, it's that, that kind of concept that, that I've unlearned, you know, is that you, you must respect kind of systems and systems got their own kind of momentum going forward. Mm -hmm. And you must respect the fact that people possibly will forget the contribution that you've made. It's not a personal thing. It's just systems move on, you know. Mm -hmm. and then, mm -hmm. um, I think it's possibly more through the lens where I'm now, where I'm looking back on corporate life for a long time. And, you know, I've been part of that system and, you know, reflecting on myself as well for people that I worked for. Um, I never, when they left the organization, say retired or moved on, I'm not always very good to keep kind of contact and, and, and keep that going. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's a kind of a thing that, that I'm experiencing now as well is that life goes on, you mm -hmm. know, uh, and um, in, in, the, in the phase of my life where I'm now is I spend a bit more time in, in, in developing and creating networks, um, you know, possibly a bit more time and energy than in the past. Mm -hmm. Hmm. All right. Well, let's begin with the 10 lessons. I believe lesson number one is the African proverb that you mentioned before. The answer is in your hands. Yes, it's, it's all about ownership, Duff. Um, and then just the, the kind of the, the, the uh, African story uh, is that it goes like this. You know, there, there was a wise old man in a village in Africa and he had wisdom and he always had kind of answers to everything. And um, two, two youths in, in, in the village decided that they were going to try and, and catch him out. And there was kind of a nestling that actually fell out of the nest a little bit. And uh, they took the bird in their hands and they actually went to this wise old man. And they said to the old man, we've got a little bird in my, our hands. Is it alive or is it dead? And he realized if he's going to say the bird is alive, they will just squeeze it and say, no, it's dead. And if he says it's dead, they will just open their hands and say, no, it's alive. Um, and his answer, and, and that's the one thing that resonated with me, his answer was that the answer is in your hands. And it's, it's about kind of taking ownership for what you do, ownership for the business that you run, ownership for the people that you work with, the team that you work with. Um, the the kind of I think the psych, psychological term for this is is internal locus of control, mm -hmm. and not to blame the system, but to take kind of responsibility for yourself and the team and your team members. Um, so that that was um, you know something that I've learned, like I said, in 1983. Mm -hmm. You know, with the story that I actually uh, when this this person shared it with me, and it just stuck with me for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Interesting thing is I've actually read a you know in I think it was in 90, uh, no, it was late, it was in 2008. I was on a, a flight from um, Sydney to Auckland and uh, there was a, a video on the plane on a study that they've done in Eden in New Zealand. It's one of the longest go studies that's been going on for uh, since 1972, where they track individuals from birth through their life stages. And the one thing that actually stands out in that study is that, um, you know, in the, the concept of self-control with children is a, a strong predictor of success in future life. Mm -hmm. uh, so that just reinforced this simple story of the answer is in your hands. Uh, and that's something that I've always actually tried to live out and also to, to share with, with uh my teams and, and the, the systems in which I've operated. Well, first of all, can you give me the email address of that African wise man? Because we'd really like to have him on the show. He seems like he knows some stuff. But I'm not sure if he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than getting duped by the young, the, the young know it all. So he put the onus back onto them, which really is where it is all the time with us, whether we uh, want to acknowledge it or not. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, list number two, culture matters and always will. Yeah, I think this is obviously a, a, a very broad concept, but I think the, the main thing here for me is, is the whole concept of purpose and, and direction. And the responsibility of uh, a person that leads a team is, is to create a culture around, you know, purpose and uh, values and, and, and 
also in terms of strategy. Um, just to actually reflect back on this, uh, Duff, is that um, in 1993, I was part of a massive merger between four banks in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And obviously, this was just before South Africa moved into democracy. And it, it was a very turbulent time, and it was a time of a high level of uncertainty. And, um, you know, I started to do some work uh, on based on a work that a uh, person by the name of Joel Barker did. And Joel's focus is on the power of vision. But the underlining thing is how important it is to have a purpose, not only for individuals, but also for organizations and even countries. And, and there's a common thread, you know, if the purpose is clear and if it's consistent and if it's articulated in a consistent way, that translates into success. Um, and it translates into a positive culture that, that actually facilitates growth and facilitates success. Mm. Um, and but the role that the leader in that context play is is extremely important and that that's something that i actually since uh, you know the 1990s since i've worked with that i actually always kept that with me um, and he also actually pulled it through to some of the work that victor frankel did you know in in mm -hmm. the concentration camps you know and he reflects on that in his uh, man's search of meaning uh, is that People who survive the concentration camps are consistently, again, people with purpose and with a positive view of the future. And again, that translates into culture. But this whole concept of a positive view of future and for a leader to talk about that in the context of the organization or the structures in which you work, I think is extremely important. Mm. How, how do you establish a culture okay you came from south africa you when we met you were running mastercard in australia then you went to the uk which is another culture and you had to um um assimilate a business that they bought and into the mastercard culture how do you as the leader as the boss how do you establish a culture in a place you know obviously this is a very broad concept but I think again, it starts off, you know, what is the vision? What is the strategy? What are the values of the organization that you want to live out? And then uh, I think to have a very clear plan and a simple plan to articulate that mm -hmm. and to consistently, consistently communicate and demonstrate that in the way that you behave. Um, and it brings me to, to my third lesson that I've learned, you know, in, in terms of this. And then is it, it is so important for a leader to consistently communicate the strategy, to consistently communicate the values, to consistently communicate the purpose of organization. Um, I think, again, in, in psychological terms, like they refer to it as to internalize it into the organization. Uh, but I always say it's like writing in the snow. You do it over and over again, and at one stage it will start to stick, you know. Mm -hmm. and, but again, I think sometimes, you know, some of us or, you know, you, you do a strategy and you work on, on the values and it's something that you just then actually park somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but the really the important thing here is to consistently uh, right in the snow until it sticks and not stop uh, writing in the snow. You know, I think it's, you need to do it over and over again. Yeah, this is your third point, your third lesson that you're riding in the snow. We're all basically riding in the snow. So you have to, um, you have to uh, write, rewrite, you have to affirm, then confirm, then reaffirm in order to, and you're saying in a, in a company culture, you do that through your behavior through your actions, through your acts, through your words, and, and the way you described it, it's so that it is one coherent whole. And then, and then it becomes a lot more believable too. Absolutely, I, I think it must be authentic as well, you know, and it, it, that links back to your integrity as a leader. You know, if it's not consistent in terms of the way that you behave, the way that you live it out, uh, you know, obviously you won't gain any traction. Um, but you know, sometimes I can remember many times where you, you communicate the values, you communicate and you live it and you communicate the strategy and you sit in a smaller group and you feel, wow, people just don't get it. 
Um, and the important thing there is not to give up, uh, but to keep on, keep on living it out, but keep on writing in the snow. Mm -hmm. It will mm -hmm. stick at one stage. And mm -hmm. so I think that is, it is, it's, I think for me, that's one extremely important part of for a leader is to consistently communicate and live the values and the strategy and, and the, the purpose of the organization mm. so that it is quite clear. Mm. All right, lesson number four. No one's ever asked me this, by the way, Eddie. What's your decency quotient? And I'm glad okay. no one's ever asked me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not quite sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, this is something that, you know, I've been exposed to quite recently. I, I think this is about um, six years ago. Um, we obviously know that the intellectual component and then they uh, refer to uh, emotional intelligence. And, uh, but the CEO of, of MasterCard, RJ Banga, introduced the, this concept of the decency occasion. And what it's about, it is about wanting something positive for everyone and to treat people with respect. Um, and, you know, RJ for me is a wonderful reference point. He lived it out. He's just got it in his DNA to be like that. And to live He's out. the former head or, of MasterCard International Worldwide, right? He's still, he's still, so uh, still, still the uh, boss. Still the CEO. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you will actually, I think his, his new role early next year will be possibly to be the chair of MasterCard and mm -hmm. somebody else will take over from him. Uh, but uh, RJ did a phenomenal uh, job with MasterCard in a way that he's actually transformed the organization. And I, I think embedded in that is this whole concept in terms of the, the culture that he's created around uh, treating people with respect and decency. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, I think, the way that it actually translated into, at least with the leadership of that organization, is uh, I think it's one of the best companies to work for. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it and I think it just reflects back to the things that we've discussed earlier as well. Uh, but RJ has actually put a bit of a tag on this and said, "This is what we should do. We should all actually be aware and and try to live out this concept of uh, the decency coefficient." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've I've tried to to integrate it. It's it's something that I think as as um, as when you actually responsible for other people, um, you know, I think the, one of the basic things that you need to do is to have that whole concept of, of, of uh, respect for people that you work with and respect for the mm -hmm. environment that you work in. Now, this seems kind of bleeding obvious, really. Now, you've been in business 40 years, so, so why, why, why does this message need to be written in the snow, repeated, affirmed, reaffirmed over and over again? It's kind of basic, isn't it? Or shouldn't it be in business? It, it should be, but I think as, as part of this, you know, it's, if, if you get into the normally kind of daily activities and stuff like that, it, you, you sometimes, you know, you, you get kind of in the operational zone and you, you get so kind of bugged in, in things that's possibly urgent but not important. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think this basic stuff that we're talking about now is not important and it's not urgent but it or it's important and not urgent mm -hmm. uh, it's something that really are extremely building blocks in terms of the future and the success of organization and i feel if if i may say you know it's it's you know this basic kind of components actually played a role in i think the success that i had as a leader uh, it's not rocket science. It's just to, to actually keep the basic stuff in mind and to live it out. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. that's the important thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, lesson number five, your mindset matters a lot. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, this is again, a, a very basic thing is, is, is the whole concept of, of, of having kind of a positive mindset in a way it reflects back on, on ownership, you know, but, you know, it's, it's, if, if, if you develop kind of a lifestyle and an approach to be positive about things and positive about outcomes, uh, it, it creates energy within yourself and it creates energy within your teams as well. Uh, this is something that I, I think I was lucky enough to get from my dad. You know, I, uh, 
I uh, actually grew up in, a, in an environment where I was quite involved in, in sport and um, you know and well let me guess so rugby somebody from south <laughs> africa plays rook am i right <laughs> uh, yeah how did you know <laughs> so uh, you know always and, and i mean in team sport you learn a lot but you know i think this this whole thing of a positive mindset is important and they are kind of two quotes that i always keep in mind you know and, and i actually got this from my dad um you know the first one is champions may stumble or fall but they never quit and a little story that I can actually share with you here is, is that, you know, I was uh, 12 years old, 13 years old, and I uh, played for my province rugby at that stage. And one of the big things that happened is we, we played an early curtain raiser for an international game between France and South Africa. And the, the day that they announced the team, I've, I've played the whole season for, for, uh, for this provincial team. And, but the day when they announced this team for to play the skirt and razor, which was just the highlight, everybody actually, I think that was a dream at that stage of your life. Um, I, uh, I was left out. I was not part of the team. And, you know, that really hurts at uh, that age too, uh, not being selected, you know, I mean, that's, uh, uh, <laughs> it well, hurts at any age, but you know, <laughs> I, I can remember that extremely well. Uh. Um, but, um, you know, and my, my dad was always, you know, he actually was in a position to actually support me and always be at my games. And he was at that practice where, where the, when the team was announced as well. And uh, when I walked off, I was actually, I was in, in tears. And I actually said to my dad, Dad, this is not going to be the last time that I play provincial rugby. I will play again. Um, champions may stumble or fall, but never quit. And uh, he actually, in a, in a way, used that throughout my life, you know, where he actually put a bit, of a, a bit of a label on me as a champion every time that I feel I struggle a bit, you know. Um, but that, that is just that, that positive energy, you know, is, 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 is not to give up, but also to see this kind of as challenge. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the other quote that I got is, you know, that my dad also shared with me at that stage is that, you know, extraordinary performances come from ordinary people with extraordinary attitude. And it's amazing how a positive attitude just rubs off on people, you know. Um, and I think all of us have been exposed to people with a negative or glass empty attitude. Uh, that sucks energy, you know, it, it just pulls energy. And uh, But I think a, a positive kind of mindset generates energy and energize people, energize yourself, and, and energize the, the, the system in which you operate. Uh, you can't be successful uh, with a glass half full kind of, uh, kind of attitude. That's just not possible. And as a leader, you must be extremely, extremely aware of that. Uh, even when it, it's, it's a challenging time, you know, and then you've got that kind of moment of weakness where you want to blame the system, we want to blame something. Uh, that makes a huge impact on, on the team. And I think as a leader, you need to be very aware of that. And um, <clears throat> this is where this is kind of positive mindset is very important is, is to share that always the positive mindset. I think that, that's extremely important. A, a psychological term for that, which I like, is, is called reframing. You take a situation and then you reframe it in such a way that yeah, makes yeah. more sense to you. And, and I think that this, what they're really- This is the first one for me. I, I haven't did that before. Uh, that, we, that yeah, makes yeah. Sense. Yeah, 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 I mean, whatever the situation is, you say you might have a, an initial visceral reaction. Oh, it's bad. It's negative. It's hostile. And I might say, and, you know, reframe it. What's good about this is always a yeah, good question. Yeah. And what, it, yeah. what you end up doing is, as you know, it's what you tell yourself, the conversation you're having with yourself, because you're always interpreting the situation, re reality, um, yeah. Yeah. or your perception of reality. And, and that's, that's an ongoing thing. And that's, that's a question I learned uh, from somebody to, to ask, what's good about this situation? And of course you want to say nothing, <laughs> but that's <laughs> not right. <laughs> okay, yeah. after, you, after you answer that, then say, okay, what's good about this? And if you look, it won't be hard to see something good about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, framing. No, that's, mm. that's a good concept. I'll definitely take that one. <laughs> um, lesson number six, far or fast, you choose. Yeah, you know, there's, there's a saying that, um, and this actually deals with, with 
teams, you know, and, you know, like I said, you know, I, I, I grew up in a sport environment, playing team sport and, and, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about, you know, how teams operate and effective teams, but this far or fast you choose, you know, the, the, the saying goes like this, you know, if you want to go fast, go on your own, but if you want to go far, go together. Mm-hmm. And it links back to everything that we've shared with each other, you know, now if, if it, in terms of what is the purpose, where do you want to go consistently communicate that and, you know, and, and, and try to mobilize your team and, and people to move with you in that direction. Um, it's not sustainable to try and go fast, you know, that this just doesn't work, you know, on, and on your own and specifically in corporate life. Uh, you, you you must understand this concept that if, if you want to have an impact, not only in terms of the organization, but if you want to have an impact in business, you can't do it on your own. You can't go far on your own. The only way that you can go far is, is with, 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 a, with people and with your team and in a corporate environment, possibly cross-functional with other teams with other kind of components in organization. And then this is this whole concept of networking in organizations is it's extremely important. And uh, so I, I think from, you know, it's something that I always remind myself, you know, is you, you tend sometimes you want to go fast, but just keep in mind, you know, if you, if you want to achieve this is you need to work and you need to take the system with you and the different components of the system. Yeah. My way of saying that, and I tell young people in business, it's not me. It's we. <laughs> it's always we. <laughs> and I get a lot of me <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, or well, I did this and I did that. And I think this is where also I think the way that we communicate is important is, is we must be so careful not to say, you know, I achieved this, I did that. It's, it's always, you know, uh, I think mm-hmm. to recognize that mm-hmm. in terms of the, the, the team that you play with or the team that you work with. Mm-hmm. Um. Point number, lesson number seven, make recognition your job. Well, I think what do you mean by that? It, it links into the, the, the previous one, you know, is, is that uh, your success is embedded in the success of the team and in success in the bigger scheme of, of the organization. But it's a, again, uh, I think that to something that you said earlier in our discussion, it's not rocket science, but it is mm. so basic. It's, it's, uh, as a leader, you must make recognition your job. And, you know, but I think sometimes we can also take recognition a, a bit f- further as well. And we don't do enough of that. But let me share a story with you that I've experienced and, and it actually had a huge impact on my life. Um, this was, I think, in, in the early 90s uh, when I worked, it was also in the financial services industry. and. Uh, the, the boss that I worked for was, he, he was really a role model for me as well in, in terms of uh, how to do things. Um, but one day when I arrived home, my wife actually showed me a letter that he wrote to her. And in the letter, he actually recognized the role that I play in the team and organization. And mm. he also recognized the role that she plays in, in, in my support. Now, this is 30 years later, and we still have that letter. It it is an extremely Mm -hmm. important part for me. And I've started to use that practice as well. You know, I I wrote many, many letters to, uh, you know, um, to my team members, kind of meaningful others, you know, partners, parents, um, you know, and uh, it is something that I think I'm possibly recognized for, but it's, it's a practice that you know, I've, I've actually got from, from uh, a boss that I've worked for. Mm. Uh, and this, this why, you know, I'm saying is that recognition is we sometimes, you know, it's again, a, a broader kind of concept that we can talk, but I think we sometimes just need to think about the power of recognizing the, our team members in the systems in which they operate outside of the working environment mm-hmm. uh, and the role that those systems actually play to support them. Uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that, you know, every end of the year, I actually wrote a handwritten letter to all of my team members, uh, you know, thanking them and their families for the support. Um, and then, and I think that is again, extremely basic thing, but, um, 
I've been on the receiving end of that and I've experienced the value of that. And, um, you know, um, I think it is something as, uh, that we as leaders uh, also, again, possibly need to be, make a bit more time for. Yeah, you know, there's a normal kind of structures in organizations which we can use to recognize, you know, and and then that's good. And then uh, I think we need to do it. But I think it's just going that extra step, that extra mile. Well, I always say, I mean, it's the, the phrase for it is psychic income, you know, the expression of appreciation yeah. of somebody. And it costs the company nothing, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and yet, why, you know, it's, it's like it's, it's such a rare currency. The exp I'll tell you a funny story because you just made me think of one. When I used to run psychotherapy groups in the Sydney psychiatric hospitals, I was dealing with the sickest of the sick. And I had a, a, a nurse, young nurse, who was assisting me just gather the patients up and kind of get the chairs in a circle, things like that. And so one, it was after Easter because the chocolates were on sale. So I bought some, some chocolates uh, uh, on sale. And then uh, the next day I went into the hospital and I said, um, I can't remember her name. I said, um, uh, a small token, a small gift to thank you for your assistance and helping me with the groups uh, over the course of these months. And she looks at me stunned and then she grabs me by the tie pulls me forward and kisses me right there on the ward in the hospital and says that's the first time i've ever been appreciated in my career wow 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 yeah. and i thought to myself should have given her a box of chocolates you know that's good of oh no no i just that just slipped out maybe we'll edit that bit out but but you know think about that a professional nurse who had been working she wasn't a kid she'd been working for years and yep. the first time and nobody ever said thanks you're doing a great job or i appreciate your efforts or and i i see that so many times i hear it so many times and um um a commercial version of that i was talking to a guy within a client company and he said to me and i always remember this yeah he said i could make money elsewhere working for another company but i'm having so much damn fun why would i leave you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. he's having an experience, a positive experience on the workforce and, and his work and it, and it makes it, and, and it was because of the people around him and the work that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, for me, it goes back to creating a culture that you're talking about becoming sort of, I think the official word for it is a, an, an employer of preference, but really it's just having a bunch of people that you, you like associating with is kind of yeah, how I yeah. see it. You know, and everything, just listening to you and, and, and reflecting on, on what we've discussed up until now, it actually goes back to, to RJ Banga's kind of decency coefficient. It's just to be decent, you know, and, and, and to treat people with respect. And I think that the challenge for a leader is, is to, to do it in difficult times when, when a team is not performing, when the team is not achieving, is to consistently be able to do that authentically and I think obviously, uh, you know, um, in a way with it's got credibility as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's an amazing story that you've, uh, you know, what, what, what was the term that you used? Psychological oh, psychic currency, right? income. Yeah, yeah. Psychic income. Just that flow of positive appreciation. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, you know, it kind of kind of cracks me up. There are whole companies, industries that are built about giving tangible in, uh, um, uh, rewards and 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 prizes. And car, and, yeah, you know, Cartier watches. Yeah, Cartier watches. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you know, and and what re, what do people really crave is the psychic income of actually feeling appreciated. I don't mean bullshit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but genuinely no. feeling appreciated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. I must remember this then. Okay. Uh, point number eight. Now you'll have to explain this one to me. I don't understand. Reverse mentoring. See, that would. That would imply that I don't know everything, see? And, and that's what I'm having difficulty with. Is so explain <laughs> reverse mentoring. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think again, you know, in a way, um, when you get older, you must also uh, understand that there's this new generations coming through in the system. And not only new generations, but, you know, Gen Y, Gen Xs and everything as well. And, and and you typically in a kind of a baby boomer kind of mindset. And then, you know, I grew up in, in a kind of way it was, you know, the management structure was on planning, organization, leading and 
executing you know that was the the mindset that i grew up in mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and in a hierarchical organization with hierarchical structures and uh, so it, it uh, and obviously you try to transform yourself as a leader uh, and you do that and one of the uh, ways that i've actually tried to do that is to, to implement the concept of reverse mentoring so what it's about Duff, is is that uh, to identify one of your high potential young and upcoming professionals in the team or and and to use him as a kind of a mentor for you in terms of how they approach life, how they approach kind of the work environment, what is important and how they actually would like to address things like that. And, you know, it, it's something that I've uh, started to do about eight years ago. Uh, and you know, it, it was of huge value for me, you know, um, in, 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 in to, to actually get kind of insights in terms of how the new generations think about work. Um, you know, I, I've briefly touched on it, but, you know, when I started to work structures, you know, the, we worked in hierarchical organizations. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then we moved on to, to kind of matrix organizations, which was, again, from a leadership point of view, something that you know i had consciously had to work on and how i adapt my kind of leadership style and quite recently or the last five years i think organizations actually moved from kind of matrix organizations to network organizations uh, where it was more about how the network comes together and works together and i think in a context of of the COVID now as well where more and more people work from home and you know, where, you know, I've heard about somebody that actually um, said, I think it possibly was you that said to me that uh, um, there was a lady that actually she's got a kind of a global team and she hasn't met two of the team members in person ever. They've been working together for three years. Hmm. But but this whole concept of, of, of uh, you know, reverse mentoring for a person that I think is in a, you know, in a possibly a different kind of life stage. Uh, was very important for me and, and, and to, to help me to understand that process. So I think it's a conscious thing as well, is, is to, to uh, consciously try and understand, you know, what the mindset is of, of, of the newer generation and what works. So that is reverse mentoring. Uh, the, the other uh, two components that I think is important is, uh, uh, is uh, the concept of sponsoring, you know, is, is uh, uh, where you the sponsor or where you the sponsored person. Um, but let, let me talk about the scenario where you the sponsored person. Um, working in a global organization, in a multicultural organization, uh, I think it's extremely important to uh, have sponsors in the organization and to consciously work on that. Uh, and specifically, you know, I think Possibly, for example, for me, moving from South Africa, South Africa to Australia and from Australia to London, uh, what I consciously did is I, I've, I've tried to identify individuals in the organization and or even outside of the organization that can sponsor me and that can help me with the transition and can help me with the cultural components of the new culture in which I, I operate. Um, you know, for example, the um, when I moved from South Africa to um, to Australia, you know, I identified a person and he added a lot of value to, to my career. But one of the, you know, he said to me two things. The first thing he said to me is, uh, don't ever compare Australia with, with South Africa. Australians don't like it. And I thought, my goodness, we like sport. Both come, you know, our countries mm. like sport. We've got more or less the same sense of humor, um, you know, and we've got kind of a similar kind of lifestyles as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've questioned him on that. And he said to me, you know, the one thing that you don't see is that Australia is a developed country and South Africa is a developing country. And there's a sensitivity around that. Just keep that in mind. So that was the one lesson. The other lesson was, uh, for example, my, my home language is, is Afrikaans, you know, and, and we use uh, the word that's in, in our language the same as must in english but it's not a strong word mm-hmm. but we use quite a lot but in 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 uh, so we tend to use the word must quite a lot when we say you must do that we must do that 
And what he said to me is be very careful. It's, it's a very strong word, mm -hmm. uh, how you apply it, you know, and, you know, I've just that awareness that he's created actually helped me quite a lot. It's two simple kind of examples, but it's actually, it, it helped a lot for me to, but they're excellent uh, think, examples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. To, to, to establish myself in a culture. So I think specifically in, in global multicultural organizations that, that, that is important to, to think about the concept of sponsorship and, and work consciously to try and identify that. And then the other one is obviously the, the normal one in terms of, of uh, a mentoring is, is to, and then there's a bit of a difference between, you know, sponsorship and mentoring for me. But in, in mentoring for me is, is where it's, it's more focused in terms of what can make you more efficient in your, your work environment you know, what you do, and there's a more possibly a technical component to that. Um, just the other thing that I've said as well is, it's also important for uh, for me to sponsor people as well. Uh, you know, not only to be sponsored. And then that's something that I've, you know, and, you know, I've approached people that actually moved into our organization, not even working for me and, and say, listen, let's, let's have this discussion. Can we have, engage in this? So I think that that is, um, it's, 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 you know, the reverse mentoring is, is something that I've got a lot of uh, mileage out and then mentoring and, and then sponsoring. I, I think as a leader, think about that and think how you actually um, use it as part of your development as well. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Um, lesson number nine, your career or any relationship is not a one day game or a one day match. If you're a cricket fan, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's, it's I think it's a four day or five day game, you know, but let, let, let me give you the context here is, um, you know, I think what we in, in terms of, uh, you know, this social media and, uh, you know, technology, uh, we live in an environment nowadays of, of instant gratification. Uh, you know, if, if you want to buy something tonight at 11 o'clock, you buy it and you get it tomorrow. You know, if you want to send a message to somebody, you WhatsApp him now and you get a kind of feedback immediately. Um, you know, and the, the whole concept of, of, you know, even emails, I can remember, I suppose you can as well, the days that we've actually operated with faxes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. we, the, the communication loop was, was long, you know, but where nowadays we, we live in the environment, it's fast, it's instant, and, and we, we need this kind of instant gratification and, and to do things fast. That is all good, but there are two things in life that instant gratification is not possible. And the one is relationships. Uh, you know, relationship is like writing in the snow. You do, you do it over and over again. You do, it's a lot of building work over a longer time is to develop sustainable relationships. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing. And the other one is as well is, is to develop your career. You know, it's, it's not a, a one day game. It is something that you build on. You've got a purpose, you've got a long-term plan and then you focus on that. You're positive about it, but it's something that you build over a longer term period. It's, so the whole concept of, of, of uh, instant success is in, in relationships and, and, and uh, careers is, is just, it doesn't exist. Mm. Uh, you know. the, the reality is incremental success is really how it happens most of the time. And, uh, you know, even, even a, a band or, or a, who becomes a, an overnight success after 10 years, you know, it's all incremental success that yeah. people just don't see or appreciate or authors. I mean, I, I, uh, um, I, I read a, um, a memoir by Stephen King, who's one of the more prolific authors and, 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 uh, his his the difficulties he had in just getting an article accepted or a short story yeah, i mean it yeah, was just yeah, yeah. and and uh, just indefatigable effort on his part and clearly he got the hang of it <laughs> so he's done pretty yeah, well for yeah. himself and the amazing thing for me as well is, is you get kind of breakthroughs or this incremental success sometimes when you don't expect it mm -hmm. uh, but if you reflect on it you know is it's been a building process as well, you know, so I think it's, it's, it's so true, you know, it's, it's an incremental process. I like that. Well, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm quoting some psychologists, but incremental success tends to work best and last longest as well. And uh, it's, um, you know, if you think about it, I mean, there's not a whole lot of rocket science to that either. I mean, it's, it's not, um, uh, it, 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 
any sport. I mean, not many people are born uh, superstars. Maybe there are a few statistical outliers, but uh, they're not us, <laughs> you know. So, um, or for example, I, I'll give you one I often like uh, think about is uh, Michael Jordan, who was considered a pretty good basketball player, but he also worked phenomenally hard to the point where. Uh, after the practices they had, if you were on the inside circle of him, then he'd invite you back home with the other players for the private practices at his gym at his house. Mm -hmm. So, and that's mm -hmm. how you knew you were sort of accepted on the team. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. What? you know, the, 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 the organized practices aren't difficult enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, all right. Lesson number 10, don't jerk the knee or shoot the mouth. <laughs> yeah, I suppose this is about, you know, is be careful what you say. And then sometimes where you get in the, in the heat of the moment, you tend to say stuff as well. And, and that's possibly, you know, in, in, in my experience, when it's, it's good just to, to say, okay, you know, take a deep breath, think about this, um, and, and, and be careful in terms of not to, to knee jerk and not to uh, react in a, in a way that can actually create kind of harm. Um, you know, that, that, so that's the one concept here. And and the other one is, you know, and I've, I've worked for somebody at one stage in my career who always, or well not always, but he frequently discussed, uh, his boss with me in a negative way. And in a way that undermined my respect for him. Um, you know, and it, it is something that I've actually applied in, in, in my career is, is never to say something negative about a co-worker or a boss, uh, but say positive stuff. If you can't say positive stuff, don't say it. Mm. Um, you know, it just creates a, a kind of a, a culture and, you know, you, I suppose you can use the term white anting as well, but uh, that just undermines any any kind of element of a positive winning culture. And um, so that's, that's why I say, you know, it's, I'm not trying to imply that you should be over controlled in terms of what you say, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the how and the when. And, and uh, I think as a leader, um, you need to have the, the awareness of, of that as well. That it, sometimes you say something that actually has a broader impact that you think it has. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate that. Mm. And, and and I think that's that's why um, the two things for me here is, you know, be careful what you say. Um, and then the second one is don't undermine uh, co-workers or, or your, even your boss in a way. It just undermines your own integrity. Mm. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Let me, uh, that finishes our 10 lessons learned. But I would like to ask you about a story and because this is one of the great management lessons life lessons that I learned from you a few years ago in um, here in Sydney. Um, see if you remember this. We, we were catching up and you had a new boss at this point in your career. And uh, the previous boss you got along well with very well. This new boss did not get along well with at all. And it was really becoming problematic. And as I recall, you, you'll have to tell the story. You, you kind of had a you kind of had a, a, a self-talk session with yourself, deciding that I got to figure this out. Yes, indeed. I mean, it, the context here is, is if, if I can, I can remember that very well done, is, you know, the person that appointed me in Australia uh, was a person that I had a huge amount of respect for him. And he was my sponsor, he was my mentor. And, you know, I was, in a way, I, I think, um, one of his, his core team members as well. So, and, and when he retired, he was replaced, uh, obviously with, with a new person and, and, and this person's kind of mission in life was to, um, to try and, and change the whole system and, uh, more specifically focus on people that were possibly too close to the previous leader. And I was one of them. Um, so I felt the brunt of that and I, I felt the very, very, dis, you know, uncomfortable and, you know, uh, I was placed in a hot seat many times in front of my team uh, for uh, possibly not always the right reasons. Um, 
And um, this is something when you go just through the process and you say, okay, is this worthwhile to do this? And again, I, I think if, if you think about the 10 building blocks that we've discussed today, you know, is, is you know, what is your purpose? Uh, you know, be positive about this. Uh, you know, be consistent in terms of what you do and, and so on. And, you know, I've uh, obviously had a, a long chat with, with, with uh, one of my, my best coaches with my wife. And, um, you know, she said to me, listen, this is what you stand for. And, you know, l do your best and let's see where it lands. And, you know, I've uh, actually made a conscious decision that, you know, uh, champions may stumble or fall, but they never quit. And I'm not going to quit on this one. Uh, long story short, and I'm extremely proud of that, is that this person uh, was possibly just before he left the organization, one of my biggest sponsors. Uh, we still have contact today, uh, you know, and um, I think we call each other, I not think, I know, we are friends. Um, and then, you know, the, the satisfaction that you get out of that to, to change a person's kind of view on, on you, uh, and this, this kind of perception was possibly built on that I've been too close to the previous boss. Um, but to to be able to to change that kind of mindset uh, is a, was for me was extremely extremely satisfying. Um, and the change was based on our outputs. The change was based on the success that we had as a team here in Australia. We won market share. We've actually, in terms of the revenue that uh, we generated for the bigger organization, we moved from number five in the world to number two in the world. So I made it easier for him as well to accept me as well, I suppose. But mm -hmm. uh, again, that that's the kind of the, I, I think all the, or most of the issues that, or components that we've discussed earlier today is is, is consistently to apply that and, 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 again not to be kind of have this external locus of control and to blame it on your boss but to focus on what you and a team can do how can you actually perform this how can you actually achieve your your kind of um, purpose and, and and your strategy and um, i think at the end of the day you know it, it, I'm, I'm, it's something that i'm extremely proud of is that uh, m most of the the people that i've worked for we have still very good relationships. I think I've shared with you the other day is that this person that shared this African story with me, um, I, uh, I haven't had any contact with him for about 30 years now. And about two or three weeks ago, I actually received on LinkedIn a message from one of my previous bosses in that same time. And he said to me that this person actually is turning 90 and uh, they would love to have to, for me to send him a message, you know, in terms of uh, wishing him all of the best and uh, and so on. And that was extremely special. So uh, we've got contact now again. Uh, this, uh, you know, and and, and it, it's it's very very special. Mm. The, the reason I like the the story with your the the difficult to get along with boss is because it shows, it reveals the, who has to make the effort. You know, I said, see, I say to a lot of younger people, stop waiting for the boss to come to his or her senses and recognize your brilliance. Yeah. You are the one, you take responsibility. <laughs> All the points you've just said, you know, the onus is on you to figure it out, to work it out, to find a way. And, um, <clears throat> it may or may not be easy. And that's why I, I, I quote that story that you tell me. And I, I did, I knew that it had a happy ending. I didn't know that the ending was that happy, but I'm not surprised. So I'm, 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 um, I'm proud of that story too, Eddie. And I did, it, was not, it wasn't even me. <laughs> oh, I suppose we, we can end where we started. It's, it's the answer is in your hands, you know, it's, 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 um, if you want to make it work, you, you can make it work, you know? And, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm also extremely proud of that. It's, 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 uh, it's, 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 it's a great, achieve, it's a great achievement to I me mean, and, and yeah. a great achievement period. And it's a really good achievement, a great achievement in the corporate world as well. Because yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. this is, there's another thing uh, that, that, uh, you know, and this is possibly about life and it, you know, I'm not sure if this will be part of the broadcast, but um, you know, I've got a very, very good friend. We went to university together, his wife and my wife as well. And we got married more or less at the same stage or same age. And uh, 
they had two daughters and we had two daughters and uh, so and we were extremely good friends and one day i arrived back from from the us and i was you know on in, in johannesburg on the airport and i got a, a phone call from him and he said to me that his, his uh, youngest daughter was killed in a car accident mm. and the one thing that he said to me obviously he was extremely emotional and he spoke about it but he said to me and we've we've discussed that many times after that as well he said to me what 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 makes it easier for him is that they don't have any any unfinished business mm -hmm. uh, you know and, and that actually was just another thing that stuck with me throughout my life you know is is try to travel light you know and and try to unpack business and and try to get kind of closure on business and don't carry grudges you know um, it just sucks energy um and uh, you know but but that's uh, it's possibly a bit outside of the the definition of what we or the framework of what we discussed today but that's another component that i think is extremely important uh, that i've experienced with a very very good friend of mine and it, it just stuck mm. with me as well okay we will finish here today on that note <clears throat> you've been listening to the international podcast 10 lessons it took me 50 years to learn this episode is produced by Robert Hossery and is sponsored by the Professional Development Forum. PDF provides webinars, social media discussions, podcast parties, anything you want, everything you need. You can, you can find out more about them at professionaldevelopmentforum.org. Best of all, everything they offer is free. Uh, thank you for listening today and we'll uh, look forward to hear, seeing you for our next podcast of 10 Lessons It Took Me 50 Years to Learn. We'd love to hear from you, by the way. You can email us podcast at 10lessonslearn.com.